Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us tonight. Uh, when we do our, um, our, our first congregational song, I'm going to ask, if, or if you want to, come on and move down a little bit. If this section would move down over here, Brother Derek wants to see you so he can see you in the eye, see you look you in the eye over there. So uh, if y'all move down, it does help a lot whenever you uh, are preaching. If y'all just move down, down this way somewhere, we'd appreciate it. Uh, they already knew it was coming when I got up and got started So uh, with that. But uh, we're glad you come to worship with us tonight. And if you're tuning in live tonight, we're glad you're worshiping with us or watching later. Just a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, Wednesday night, we will be meeting at 6 in the chapel. Everybody that comes to prayer meeting will meet uh, Wednesday in the chapel at 6. Come and be a part of that. Also, we will uh, not have a Wednesday night supper. And if you are still contemplating or praying about giving to the tornado relief, we will be taking that up until Jan January the 9th. Just put on your envelope, tornado relief, and we'll be sending a check to um, a couple of different towns there, Maysville, and I forgot the name of the other one uh, that we had chose to send to uh, uh, checks for tornado relief. I don't know if you watched the news yesterday, but Christmas Eve, two of the churches that were totally destroyed met in the parking lot, and they had a joint service in the parking lot and uh, so that they could tell the community the church was still going to go on and so the church could say goodbye to their buildings because they were fixing to demo both of those buildings. And that was their, their service for that. And and everything. They had about 100 come out, they said. It was a good service, so uh, let's continue to pray for them and pray for all those churches and all the folks affected there. Well, it is good to see you at this time. Brother Jim's going to come up and lead us in prayer, and we're glad you come to worship with us tonight. We did a revival in that... Uh near Mayfield, in Hard Money Baptist Church. If you ever go there, take some money with you. <laughs> oh, let's pray. Our Father, we come tonight in Jesus' name to thank you for the love of God, for the expression of your love through our Lord Jesus Christ and who he was, who he is, and what he's done, what he's doing. We thank you, loving Father, for grace that allows us to tolerate each other, let alone have fellowship with you. And Father, we pray tonight for hurting people across this world, especially these in our community. We pray, dear God, that, uh, that some way, somehow, in that storm-ridden area that you would manifest yourself in such a way that uh, you would attract attention from Christians across this world that we might indeed help our brothers and sisters that we'll never see on this side but who are doing their dead level best to survive this with faith and courage Lord, we turn our minds toward this service tonight and we think of Derek as he stands to speak to us. Lord, there's nothing in this crowd that would excite a preacher as far as numbers are concerned. But who knows what's going to happen when your word is preached but you. And Lord, I pray that you'd give Derek that, that energy one more time to preach to us as he does that you would uh, you'd stimulate the thought process in him through the Holy Spirit and that the words that come out of his mouth would find a place to land in our minds and hearts even though we're, most of us are weary from a week of eating and fellowship and all that we've done. Father, we turn our minds toward our nation and realize that America is going through a great spiritual sickness. Lord, we are, uh, we're struggling, we're stumbling. Churches are closing. People are walking out of the house of God and never looking back. God, we understand that 
the last days are taught in your word. But Father, we're left here to minister during these days, and we pray, oh God, you'd give us that that we need to help us not only keep going, but to go in a great pace. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you will, stand up, fellowship with those around you, and then we will sing, Go, Tell It on the Mountain.
Here they come. While they're coming up, I'll testify for just a second. I know uh, all y'all had children before play ball and different things, and you get excited when they score in soccer or football or anything like that. Well, it's real good when you watch your children uh, have a love to want to get in the ministry or something like that, get up and lead music or, or, or help in different areas. And I, I know those of you that are fathers that have children, that have done that, you're most proud of them. And so it's like a touchdown for me to watch my boy get up here and uh, lead in the music. <laughs> Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night that we could come together. Lord, it's uh, appointed tonight for each of us that are here to hear what you have for us. And we already thank you for the music. We thank you for uh, these past days where we celebrated your son's birth, we thank, thank you for the accomplished work of Calvary, Father, and the adoption we have as your family. Father, I ask that you would um, bless Brother Derek tonight as he stands up, just uh, loose him, Lord, to preach like he never has, and give us ears to hear and to be obedient and to yield to what you'd have to say to us tonight. Father, I also ask that you bless the offering that we give from our hearts. And I ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.
matchless in grace and mercy there is nowhere we can hide from your love you are steadfast never failing you are faithful our creation is in love of who you are you're the healer of the sick and the broken you are comfort for every heart in loss our king and our savior forever for eternity we will sing of all you've done for eternity we will sing of all you've done and we sing god with us god for us nothing can come against no one can stand between us god with God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. Your heart in moves with compassion. There is life, there is healing in your love. You're the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done. We sing, God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between us.
Luke chapter 18. There we are, knocking. Got a little more gusto to my voice now. Um, hopefully everybody had a Merry Christmas. Hopefully everybody ate enough. I said that this morning. When I said that to you this morning, I was actually trying my best to work through supper from last night. And so um, I feel like I'm finally done and uh, ate a little bit this afternoon. So apparently I can still do it. Um, so I don't know where you're at right now if you feel a little... Let me, let me encourage you, you will eat again. And it, it is good. It's still good. I still like it. Um, I, I love Christmas. I think I've told you all that a few times. I, I think um, looking back on it now, um, Megan and I, before we had Deacon and Judah, I did love Christmas then. Uh, but now with Deacon and Judah, I really love Christmas. And uh, so those of you who are parents, you know what I'm talking about. I, for one, believe I was born to be a dad. Uh, because I feel like now I'm hitting my stride uh, with an eight-year-old and a five-year-old on Christmas. Hey, I'm right there with them. Um, I try to hide it from Megan just so she's not embarrassed of me because she is taking pictures and videoing a little bit on Christmas. So I'm trying my best to, to tone it down. That way, when we get older, she doesn't have to say, I tell you that, Derek, he was embarrassing on Christmas morning. I'm trying to be civilized, but my inner child is... Uh, He's loving it. He really is loving it. But still got one to go. Uh, so I'm stretching, getting ready to rip into something again. Uh, we'll, we'll be good to go. Anyway, I love Christmas. One of the things that I love about Christmas more than, uh, more than a lot of other things is I love the lights. I, I don't know how you are. Uh, we love to ride around, look at the lights. There's a house down the road from where we live. They, um, they have their lights synced to music. And you can tune in on the radio. Hey, we're, we're in. We're in. We sat there. Um, at an uncomfortable amount of time, I believe, we watched it. And not only did we watch it, we had to drive through their driveway, which is weird to me. Uh, just at random people at random points of night, just driving through your driveway, looking at everything. I, I, just, I thought it was weird, but I loved it. Um, but one of the things that I love about decorations is, you know, people will set up the nativity scene. And so we'll have Mary and we'll have Joseph. And uh, you might have some shepherds there. D depending on how elaborate your nativity scene is, uh, you got some wise men kind of standing off. you got a, a star or an angel. And then at the center of everything, you've got a baby, right? And, and so we, we got Jesus there. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed around Christmas time as a believer now is that um, even people who are nominal Christian. Um, they, they celebrate, and, and they have no problem with baby Jesus. Even lost people um, may decorate their yard, and they may have a Jesus in their yard, and not even be a follower, not even be a Christian, but have a, have a baby Jesus, because that, that's what you do on Christmas. And so I, I was thinking about these things, and uh, it, it just strikes me as, as odd uh, that this time of year, um, you've got everybody's focused in on a baby in a manger, and everybody's decorating with him, and, and you got a, a lost world who denies all that, trying their best to get around it, and they can't quite get around it, and when you hear people on TV, like on CNN, try to talk about Christmas and avoid Jesus, it gets awkward, because they're trying to do a dance around him, and you know what they're talking about, and so everybody this time of year, there's, you got to focus in on Jesus, because he's the reason for everything that we're doing right now. Um, but one of the things that I find odd is that the world has no problem with, with baby Jesus. So what, what, it's, what it's saying to me and what I'm seeing is um, we have no problem with a baby in a manger. But they do have a problem with a king on a throne. And so what we're going to get to tonight in Luke chapter 18 is what may be true for some of us. We have no problem with baby Jesus in a manger um, and, and Easter's coming up, so some people that we saw this morning will come back that Sunday. And they, we, we love a Savior on a cross, but it's really the, the king with the crown that a lot of us have a problem with. And so in Luke chapter 18, this is one of my favorite interactions in the Bible with Jesus and a rich young ruler. And I've taught on it a, a lot, uh, and I debated on whether or not to teach it again. But something that I've learned about the Word of God is uh, it's inexhaustible. You know, we could, we could take this text and every single person in here could teach something they get from just a verse of Scripture. And we would all have something different. Because God's Word is inexhaustible. It is a, it is a, a fountain that there is no bottom. 
And so we can swim around in this as long as we want to, and, and we, we can discover truths about God and who He is and, and truths about ourselves, too. And so in Luke chapter 18, I'm, we're going to read it. Uh, Luke 18, starting at verse 18. This uh, rich young ruler, there, there may be some characteristics that we see in his life here tonight that may be true for us, and if that's true, then we need to change that. Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Listen to verse 26. Those who heard it said, Then, then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And uh, God, I thank you so much for your word. Father, I pray that tonight, um, Lord, that you would speak through me, God, that you would give me strength, boldness, courage. God, that you would uh, help me in my weakness to do what you've called me to do. God, I pray you give me words tonight, and I pray you open our hearts, open our minds, help us to hear. God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see. God, if there be any sin in us, um, Lord, convict us. Father, if there's um, anyone in here tonight who's placing an idol above you and refusing to let go of it, God, I pray that uh, you show them your surpassing worth. Lord, and uh, I pray you help us through this time of year. God, help us, help us not just to stay focused on you for a week out of the year, but every day. God, help us to fix our attention on you. We love you, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So um, I know everybody in here has heard a sermon on the rich young ruler. Um, you've heard one from me multiple times. Uh, you've heard them from Brother Brent, Brother Troy, uh, Sunday school classes. Everybody's, this is, a, this is a pivotal point in a man's life. And I think the reason why we hear so much about the rich young ruler is because all of us can see ourselves in him. There's, there's a little bit of all of us in this interaction. And so what we have happening, you got a, a rich young ruler, and um, I, I'm not saying, uh, I've read a lot of commentaries about who he is, everybody's kind of speculating on what actually he did and, and what his job was. Um, a lot of people think he was a religious ruler, I, I, I don't know about that. I do know that he was a well-to-do man in town, and that he was a, uh, he held a position of authority in the village. And so not only was he a ruler uh, in that sense, but he's also a very religious man. Um, and so this would be somebody maybe in here uh, that I would look to Deacon and Judah and say, hey, when you grow up, I want you to be like that man. Right. A, a great role model and just somebody a good. And, what, and I, I use that term loosely because of a verse we just read. But somebody would say, hey, that's a good man. That is, a, that is a good, godly man, and I want my sons to grow up to be like him. What a role model. And so as Jesus is, is kind of there, and this, this man, who we would assume to be like a, a ruler, a, one of the elites, the religious, like he's, he's one of us. He approaches Jesus, uh, and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, there, there's a lot that's, that's said here and a, a lot that I, I wish we could really jump on into. But you know the way you address Jesus says a lot about who you are? Did you know that? And so when, when the rich young ruler approaches Jesus and he says, good teacher. Well, that says a lot about the rich young ruler and how he sees Jesus and how he sees himself. So he doesn't say, Lord. He calls him a good teacher. And so what the rich young ruler is saying is, you're a teacher, I'm a student. 
And so he's saying, intellectually, I'm grabbing a hold of what you're teaching. And so I, I'm, I'm accumulating knowledge. So I want to learn from you. But Jesus doesn't want him just to learn from him. Jesus wants him to follow him. And so he says, good, good teacher. And so my question for us tonight, just kind of starting off, how, how do you address Jesus? Because the way we address him and the way we approach him says a lot about who we are. And I know a lot of people... Uh, nobody in this room, so I'm not calling anybody out, but I've heard, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard junior high kids pray. You, you don't know what you're about to get a hold of. Like that, I, I remember a few years ago, there was this weird, oh, it was, it was, it, it was kind of sickening. Uh, there was this weird uh, thing that started happening, a craze, where people would start praying and they would say, hey, dad. And I'd go, oh, well, that sounds weird. And, and I don't know what it was about that. Hey, Dad, and, and they would just start praying. It's like, ah. Oh. And it come with a little reverence, you know, like, hey, Father, call him, call him Father. But I, if that bothers you, awesome. If not, maybe that's just on me. Uh, but uh, the way we address Jesus, you know, I've, I've heard people pray and they kind of come to him arrogantly, like with a little swagger in their tone. And I, I, you know, humble yourself a little bit. You know who you're talking to, right? Um, and, and so I, sometimes I think, and, and I could be wrong, but your, your prayer life says a lot about how you view God. And I, I just know a lot of people that come in to talk to Jesus with their chest out and kind of beating their chest about stuff they've done and kind of bragging in your prayer. Hey, watch it. You, you don't, uh-uh. You, you need to understand that you're walking into a throne room and it's not yours. It's His. Now, we do approach him boldly with confidence, but it's not your boldness and your confidence. It's because we're in Christ. And so when we approach God, we approach him humbly, and we call him Lord. So if I call Jesus Lord, what does that make me? Servant. You see what I'm saying? When the, the rich young ruler approaches Jesus, he says, good teacher. Uh, that's a wrong view. Was he a teacher? Yeah, he was a teacher, but he's Lord. And so be careful. And this, this is just free, y'all. I don't have notes, but if I did have notes, it wouldn't be in it. But we need to watch how we approach God's throne room. And we need to approach God reverently. Anyway, that, maybe that was just for me. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So not even the way that he addresses Jesus, but then the question that he asks. He asked the question all wrong. He says, what do I need to do? Tell me what to do. There has to be something that I can do. Now, here's something that I think may key on into something that we may all be struggling with. What this man wanted was behavior modification. Tell me how to modify my behavior to get the kingdom of God, to go to heaven when I die. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me how to clean myself up. Give me five steps to Jesus. Right? You ever been to uh, <laughs> any bookstore and you go in the Christian, uh, it's smaller now than it used to be, you go in the Christian aisle and you're looking through and there's like a whole side of the section that's Christian self-help. And, and Osteen's got his best stuff there and Meyer's got her stuff there and 10 steps to have a good Christian life. And so this is what the rich young ruler was looking for. Tell me what to do to have eternal life. I want behavior modification. Now, here's the, the kicker. The man wanted behavior modification. Now, I did a little Googling when I got home uh, earlier today. To modify something means to make it better. And so listen to the man's question knowing that. How can you make me a better person? Because that's what I want. I want to be better. And at the root of his question is, tell me how to be better. And you know, there are a lot of people in church today and that's what they want. I want to be a better person. I'm a bad, I'm a bad person. Help me to be a better person. Books out there, y'all, that's filled with trash. And people are soaking this stuff up and they want the five steps and the 10 ways and, and they're going out and they're spending money and you can go buy a book on how to make money and the guy selling the book on how to make money. And like it's all a, a circus now and you've got all this stuff getting thrown at you and this man comes to Jesus and he says, make me, tell me what I need to do to be better. And maybe you're here tonight because, hey, 
this is what you do on Sunday night, and this is making you, as you would say, better. You have modified your behavior. But here's the thing with Jesus, and, and we're going to get to this in just a minute. The man wanted behavior modification. Jesus wanted life transformation. That's two really radical, radically different things. So modification would be make, to make something better. Transformation would require a radical change in lifestyle. So what the man did not want was life transformation. And so to kind of go back to where we started, a lot of us have no problem with a baby in a manger because the baby's not very threatening, right? A baby, I don't know about your baby, but a baby's not going to boss you around and, and tell you what to do and be lord over you. But a king on a throne, he's lord. And you have to submit and you have to obey. And those are words that our culture today does not like. Submission? Obedience? Uh-uh. And so we've got a lot of people, uh, I believe, involved in the Christian church today who have no problem with baby Jesus. But when you start to talk about submission and obedience and, and giving Jesus loyalty and giving Him your life and it's going to cost you to follow Jesus, this is the Jesus that a lot of people have a problem with. Because we like a baby in a manger, but we don't like a king on a throne. Because a king on a throne is threatening. And you are lower than him. And so we don't really like that. And so this man approaches Jesus. And I think a lot of us are approaching Jesus like he's still in a manger. Right? And so we approach Jesus and we talk to him like he's, he's a good teacher. He's, he's a baby in a manger. And, and what this looks like is tell me what to do. Tell me how to modify my behavior so that I can get eternal life, so that I can enter into the kingdom. And Jesus goes right to the heart of this issue, and, and he says something to the guy that's it's quite strange. Um, in verse 19, Jesus said, And why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And I've heard Brother Brent say this so many times. Jesus is saying to the rich young ruler, If you're going to call me good, call me God. Right? He, he approaches him wrong. He doesn't recognize him as being God in the flesh. He just comes to him as a, a good man. Now, Jesus does say something here that we all need to hear. Jesus says, no one is good except God. And so I, I don't know about you, but I need this one. And so my, my inner works-based righteousness that I picked up as a kid and tried to tote into my relationship with Jesus that I keep trying to crucify and kill needs to hear, hey, Derek, you're not good. You are not a good person. And the reason why we need to hear that tonight is because a lot of us think that God owes us stuff. Have you ever been to a funeral and, just, and somebody stands up here and says, I just don't understand why this happened to such a good person. Well, I got news for you. He's not good. And she's not good. And so once we get a proper understanding of who Jesus is, who God is, and who we are, everything else kind of falls into line. And so when people think they're good and God owes them stuff, that's religion. Religion says, do this and God will love you. The gospel says, God loves you, so he did this. And so I just think there are some of us that are so caught up in this. If I go to church, God owes me. If I pray, God owes me. If I do this, God owes me stuff. God doesn't owe you anything and no one in this room is good. And so when bad things happen to what we would call good people, it's not God's fault. See, if, if you can put God in your debt, then he does owe you. The thing is, you can't put God in your debt. And we've talked about this a lot. There's, there's nothing you can give to God that he doesn't already own. And so when we say, man, why? And I, I know this question because I was there in college. If God is good, then why do bad things happen to good people? Well, the thing is, there, there are no good people. And that, hey, Merry Christmas, right? <laughs> I feel like I could drop something. <laughs> there are no good people. Only God, only God is good. And so when things happen, hey, we live in a fallen world. And, and if you read the Bible, you would, you would clearly read that 
hey, you are at enmity with God. When we were at our worst, when we were his enemies, that's when Christ came and died for us. Not when you clean yourself up, not when you started tucking your shirt in one day a week and owning a Bible with pictures in it. Like, that's not when God chose to love you. He chose to love you at your worst. Anyway, no one is good except God alone. Verse 20, you know the commandments. Do not murder, uh, or do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I've kept for my youth. So he's self-righteous. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. So, so here's, here's an interesting dynamic that has just happened. The, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, tell me what I need to do. And Jesus turns it around on its head and he says, no, I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. I'm going to tell you what you need to lose. And see, here's, here's something for all of us. Uh, our walk with God is dependent on us losing the idols that we've built in our lives. Now, everybody loves Jesus until he touches your golden calf, right? Everybody loves baby in a manger. But when you come to the king on the throne and he starts to point out things in your life that shouldn't be there, that's when we back up and go, whoa, ugh, that's not really the Jesus I signed up for. I want the Jesus, and don't act like you haven't heard this, I want the Jesus that will let me live in my sin and I can go to heaven. The problem is, that's not this one. We have created our own, and we hold him out, and he, y'all, he's palatable to this culture. And so there are a lot of people today who hold out a Jesus who says, you can go live in your sin, live your life the way you want to, and he'll forgive you and you go to heaven. That's not Jesus. And so, so many people are holding up this false Christ and showing this when the Jesus of the Bible, he, and we'll get to this in a minute, Luke chapter 14, he wants all of you. He doesn't want a little bit, and let me give it to you this way. He doesn't want your Sunday, and then you can have the rest of it. You get what I'm saying? He, he doesn't, and we can not even, we could go in here and say, not all day. He wants you Sunday morning. And for some of us who are radical, our Sunday night. But everything else is yours. That's the Jesus that we've created. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus wants everything. He wants our Monday, Tuesday. Like, we could go through the week. He wants every day of our life. Every day should be a day of us pouring out worship to God. Not just one hour a week on a Sunday morning where we have to dust off our Bible and open it up and then say, I'm Christian. Jesus wants everything we have. And so everybody loves Jesus until he touches your idol and then you back up. And so what happened with the rich young ruler right here, he said, what do I need to do? Jesus said, it's not what you need to do, it's what you need to lose. There's something in your life that has to go. And y'all need to hear me, and I feel like we say this all the time. It's not that his money was evil. It's that his love of it was. You hear me? Because a lot of us equate money with evil. No, it was, and Brother Brent says it this way, um, he didn't have the money, the money had him. Right? And so it was his, I value my wealth over you and so yours may not be wealth it may be something else so what would if if Jesus were in here tonight and he was walking from person to person and he said Derek there's one thing you lack you got to get rid of this come follow me what would it be in Derek Fretwell's life that he would say, Derek, you love this more than you love me. And, y'all, that's, that's where it gets real, isn't it? If he were to come to you tonight and say, Miss Pam, what, what do you love more than me? It's got to go. Right? Paul Paul? Wendell, there's one thing you still lack. Go and get rid of this and come and follow me. And so sometimes, y'all, we come to Jesus with a hand behind our back. 
and we say, Jesus, I give you everything. And he says, what's in your other hand? And we don't want to open it. No, this is, Jesus, you don't understand. I'll give you my Sunday and my Wednesday, but, but this is my Friday and Saturday. I, I, haven't I given you enough? And there, there's one thing you still lack, Derek. I want your Friday and Saturday. You don't understand. I want everything. I want it all. I, I don't want a piece of you. I don't want a part of you. I want everything that you have. And so when you get to this Jesus in the Bible, this is when people back up and say, I don't want that one. I want the one that, that'll let me live in sin. I want the one that's, and, and y'all, this sounds so crazy. I want the popular Jesus that's cool with me living my life the way I want to live it. And there's a lot of people who hunger for that and they thirst for that. And this is God's judgment on them. He's giving them exactly what they want. Not only that, he's raising up preachers that preach what they want. And so you've got these massive congregations of people who are in there worshiping a the Jesus they've created. And then when you preach the Jesus of the Bible, they don't recognize him. I've never heard that. Well, this is who Jesus is. This is him. And so many people today are, are living life and... I don't know what they're doing. Haven't you ever run into some people and you've heard them say something or you watch their lifestyle and you go to them and you say, listen, brother, I love you. Can, can I tell you about Jesus? Oh, yeah, I know him. You're living in sin. Yeah, yeah, but you know, God loves me still. You're bearing fruit, brother, that doesn't, doesn't line up. You, you're saying you're a lemon tree. Do they grow on trees? That's a question. Yes. You're saying you're a lemon tree, but you got oranges. Like, what's going on? Well, you know, my, my Jesus, and have you ever heard somebody say that? My Jesus does this. I, I, I'm not asking you about your Jesus. I'm asking you about the Jesus. It, it, that doesn't line up with the Bible. And so what this rich young ruler could have done as he left there, he could have said, well, uh, okay, I don't like this one. I'll go find me another one that'll let me keep my wealth, let me, let me keep the idol in my life. That church down there is preaching a, a radical gospel. This one up here is lenient and, and, and liberal. I like this one. And so what we have and what's happening now, you see it everywhere throughout this Christmas season. We've got like a Jesus buffet line. Pick the one that works for you. And people are making up stuff and it's crazy. And I know it has to break the heart of God. And so my question for us tonight is what Jesus are you following? Are you following a Jesus that's cool with you and okay with you, continuing to walk in sin and not convicting you of it? Because if you are, it is not the Jesus of the Bible. There's a life transformation involved. Jesus wants everything. There has to be a radical lifestyle change that takes place. And in the Bible and in theology, they call it regeneration. You have been regenerate. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, right? All things have become new. Notice Paul doesn't say, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a better person. Jesus didn't come to modify your behavior. He came to replace you. You are a new creature. And I know I've heard this from this pulpit, either from Brother Brent or Brother Benson or Brother Troy, um, where, where they would say, and I think I just forgot it, um, the things that you used to love, now you hate, and the things you used to hate, now you love. You've got a new desire center. You have desires for things uh, now that you used to not desire. I, I can go ahead and tell you, uh, all throughout my student life, there was one thing I hated. Reading. I hated it. So I would YouTube stuff, I would cliff note, and even read cliff notes. I was going, this is the longest book I've ever read in my life. And I, I, I just, I despised it. And so I don't know how I made it through college. I think Megan did my homework. I don't know what happened, but I just hated reading. I gave my life to Jesus. 
And I picked this up and I couldn't stop reading it. And what it is, is I was reading about someone I loved. A subject that I cared about and everything changed in my life. So now I have desires to do things that I used to not desire. And I know that's a simple explanation and a simple illustration, but it should be the same in our lives when it comes to sin. There used to be things before I came to Christ that I loved doing. But now that I'm a believer, I hate those things. They break my heart and they make me sick. What happened? I've been made a new creature. Is that true for your life? Are you a new creature or are you trying your best to modify your behavior and become a better person? Can, can I tell y'all and let y'all in on a little secret? Do you, do you know that good people go to hell? Every day. Well, who goes to heaven? Those bought by the blood, regenerated followers of Christ who have repented of their sins and placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So you can try your best to put on this good person role. It's not helping you. This rich young ruler, that's what he wanted. And I feel like for some reason he may have already had that, but it wasn't enough for him. He needed more. Tell me how to be a better person. My goodness, we got a hammer on it now. Um, Jesus said this. He said, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have, distribute to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Listen to verse 23. When he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Y'all listen, this is not a man who has a little money in an account. This would be someone that would be extremely wealthy. So for him to give up his wealth and give it to the poor would be no little thing. It would cost him. Can I, can I tell you something? Following Jesus will cost you something. Can I tell you something else? Not following Jesus will cost you everything. In, in Luke chapter 14, I want, I want to jump there really quick. I didn't mean to go this long. It's Christmas, and I'm still kind of full. In Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25, listen to the invitation given by Jesus. Now, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Verse 33, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's Jesus. When's the last time you heard an invitation like that one? A lot of times I've noticed in my own life that down in the youth room on Wednesdays, I'm, I'm so eager for people to come to Christ that it's, I, I'm so convicted of it. After I go home, I'm almost, I got a headache that I almost try to sell Jesus to them. You know, we don't have to. I don't have to sell Jesus. I don't have to try to give you something that's better. I, I can't. But so many times I'm, I'm like, man, I just want people to come to Christ. And, and if, I feel like if I tell them the truth, then they won't come. When we have the example from Jesus himself in Luke chapter 14, he gives them everything. He says, listen, anyone who wants to come after me, you've got to renounce everything that you have. If you don't, you cannot be my disciple. Give up everything. I want your life. I want everything that you are. I want it. Y'all, not only that, not only does he want it, he deserves it. 
He gave everything for us, and He requires everything in return. He requires loyalty. He demands obedience. And can I tell you something? There's not a single thing that I've given up in my life that I regret losing for the sake of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that Jesus said that has to go that I looked at and went, I wish I had that back. Do you know why? The worth of knowing Jesus Christ and the value of it outweighs everything else. Have you come to that place yet? Have you moved from the baby in a manger that you have no problem with, but the king on the throne? Have you talked to him yet? Because I I just feel like there are a lot of us who, we got no problem with the baby. And we love Easter, that Jesus would love us enough to die for us. That's the gospel. We, we love that and we celebrate that, but it doesn't stop there. From the cradle to the cross to the crown. He's on a throne now and he's ruling and he's reigning. And he demands obedience and he demands loyalty. He wants everything. And according to Luke chapter 14, if you're not willing to give everything... You can't be his disciple. That's the cost. Is it going to cost you? Oh, yeah. Is it worth it? You better believe it. There was something I learned at Southern, and I didn't learn much. But in business school, I learned a a term called return on investment. And for some reason, that one is stuck with me. And y'all, the return on investment in this life is unbeatable. (laughs) Hey. I lay everything at his feet. For a a chance to have a relationship with God and to know him. And not only that, when I breathe my last breath here to be in glory and have a resurrected body and to live for eternity with him, the return on investment here, hey, it's it's a no-brainer. So my question for you is, what in the world, in your life, is it that you're refusing to give up for Jesus? You you know the Bible would say, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? You know, everything here is temporal. Everything. Your soul is not. It'll live forever. Forever. So you have an invitation tonight. You have an opportunity to give Jesus everything. I I want to implore you. That would be a word that Paul would use. Implore you. I want to urge you. Hey, give him your life. Those sins that you refuse to let go of, that idol, that that you just can't quite let that fist go. You, You just can't open that hand. Open that hand. Experience the freedom of knowing that you're a child of God. Hey, experience the freedom of knowing that you're at peace with God now. There's nothing better. So I don't know who's coming forward to sing. Is it Aaron? There you go. I want to pray for us. I'm sorry that uh, I went a little long. I wanted to keep it a little short. I know some of us have a long ride in the morning. Um, But Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. If there's somebody in here tonight who has not given their life to Jesus, please, with all that I am, I I can't urge you enough to do that. Don't let anything hold you back from this. Father, we love you. God, we thank you so much for your son. God, thank you that you loved us enough to send your only begotten son. God, that uh, whoever, whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God, thank you, Father, that um, as a senior in college, Lord, you convicted me of sin. Uh, You revealed yourself to me. I came to you with both hands open. I gave you everything I had. And God, you blessed. And and God, if I had to do it all over again, I would have done it earlier. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace, your mercy. God, I pray for that one in here right now. God, who, who does not want to let go. 
Father, I pray right now you call them by their name. Father, reveal yourself. Show them grace. Show them mercy. Show them love, compassion. Show them what you did for us on the cross and the empty tomb. We love you. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand up. Eric's going to sing. Amen. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Let me ask you something. Do you remember the day you went to Jesus with both hands out? You remember that? You remember how you walked away from there? Isn't that awesome? Don't forget that. Uh, don't forget it. Y'all be in prayer for our group as they travel down to Orlando. Uh, they're leaving at 6.30. A lot of them's done left. They want to get a head start on Disney. Brother Eric, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> Y'all be in prayer for them as they're down there, uh, that they would have a safe trip. Um, Mr. Billy, you mind closing this out in prayer?